Oh, yeah, that's pissed him. Damn, chest. You're a pig. You're a pig. Sl slut. You're a pig. You're a pig. <laughs> you slut that slut from China, Japan, and Orient. I mean, the Orient. You Oriental prostitute. Slut. You Orient. You Orient. You Orient. You Oriental prostitute. Damn, why the fuck did I do that? Okay, you slant that slut. STUPID! Oh, no. That was me being stupid for saying stupid. You slut that slut. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. You stupid. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Suck my motherfucking dick, bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. Suck my motherfucking dick, bitch. I can hurt spit it. It's 
Spit, 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 spit. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Suck my dick, bitch. Spit, 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 spit. I fuck his. Ho! Oh! I mean, I stuck my dick in his butt and twisted. Slut out. Oh, there's a cute girl. She's cute. Oh, touch her head. I wish I could tell her she's cute. What the fuck is happening here? Moose, slut. I'm not. Talk I'm not calling her that. Come on, I'm talking to this game. Come on, slut. Register the slut. Oh, this goddamn thing that me send her a fucking message telling her she's cute. That whore, that whore, that whore, that whore. Suck. You fucking... That's not gonna work, you... God, fuck it. God, fuck it. You may be cute, but you're stupid. Stupid, 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 stupid. Get that whore, that whore, that whore, that whore out of here.
I ain't try, trying to get my fucking king in check, you slut. I see a dick in your future. I see a dick. 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 I probably regret the fuck out of that. Yep. Come on, damn it. Oh, I lost my fucking rook. Come on, slut. Move! You slut. Move, slut. I see a dick in your future. I see a dick. Dick, 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 kiss that real goodbye. Ah! Damn, I'm fucking her up. He's fucking you up. I'm fucking you up. Move. Yep. Get your whore and check it. I'm. I may. I'm. I. I may even take. <laughs> Kiss that whore goodbye. That whore. That whore. That whore. That whore. I outsmarted you, honey. I outsmarted you. Me and my long arms outsmarted you. I fucked her. Ho! <laughs> I beat the fuck out of her. I beat her mother. I beat her fucking ass. I asked her up. I dicked her up. I stuck a dick of her butt and twisted. Slut. No, she's not a slut. She's cute. But, you know, I, I just say that word anyways. <laughs> that was so damn funny. I took her whore out for a poison dinner. That whore, that whore, that whore, that whore. Vast number of children who have died without being baptized. God, fuck it. Either She's cute. That woman's cute. <laughs> that woman's so cute. Are we born sinners? Is original sin and total depravity biblical? In this series, we'll consider the doctrine's historic and modern articulations, take a critical spit. look at potential spit. problems spit. that arise, spit. examine spit. the various passages Slut. used to teach this, considering the immediate and larger context and the grammar and word choice as we seek to be good Bereans. 
Son of a In this episode, slut. we'll take a look at original sin as it relates to the doctrine of infant damnation. One of the more controversial doctrines to come from original sin is that of infant damnation. The belief that God sends infants and young children to hell. Essentially, there are two similar lines of reasoning. Man is created with Adam's sin nature and guilt. Without faith in Christ, regeneration and baptism all go to hell. Man's life begins at conception. Thus, man possesses the sin nature and guilt the moment he exists. Therefore, the aborted and miscarried babies go to hell. Or, God only punishes the guilty. Mankind has been punished with an inherited sin nature and death. Therefore, God views the entirety of mankind as guilty. The guilty deserve God's eternal wrath. Therefore, all are created deserving the wrath of God. Therefore, aborted babies and miscarried babies go to hell. Thus, if original sin were true, everyone would deserve hell from the moment they come into existence. Personal sins, knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, even one's age are therefore irrelevant. According to original God, sin, we were all in Adam when he sinned, you son and of thus bitch. we all deserve eternal punishment. So the first you Adam son of a slut. came, fell, and all of us in him Suck go down bitch. with him, and we're born rebellious. You don't have to learn rebellion. You don't have to learn to sin. You are sinful. I was born sinning. You're born sinning. And we're under the wrath of God because of it. You Quoting from the apocryphal bitch. wisdom of Solomon, Augustine of Hippo wrote, Certain infants, even you those suck baptized, dick, he bitch. does not take from this life as adopted into the eternal you kingdom, and does dick, not bitch. confer on them the great benefit given of him who we read dick. he was taken away, lest you wickedness dick, alter bitch. his understanding. Fulgentius wrote, Be assured, uh, that so little children who have begun to live in their mother's womb ah, and have I'll their chase that whore the kingdom come who having just been born have passed away from the world without the sacrament of holy baptism administered in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they must be punished by the eternal torture of undying fire. For although they have committed no sin by their own will, they have nevertheless drawn with them the condemnation of original sin. Ah, uh, see you, Dick, in your future. Ah, uh, see you, Dick. Since the time of Augustine, Dick. men were carefully Dick. attempting to address this problem of original sin as it relates to infants and young uh. pass away. Always assuming original sin was biblically sound, they invented entirely new doctrines uh. to plug the theological holes. They innately knew that children were innocent, but they defaulted to this presupposition of original sin. So how could they reconcile these diametrically opposed beliefs? That children are innocent, and yet not innocent, and deserving God's wrath. Many Roman God Catholics came to reject the teaching of men like Augustine and Fulgentius on infant damnation, and instead believed that young children didn't go to hell, but rather a place of eternal natural joy, lacking both the necessary supernatural grace to enter heaven and the knowledge of such a loss. In the 1200s, the concept of limbo began evolving, and by the year 1300, the term limbo of infants was coined. For a while, this teaching of limbo seemingly addressed the ramifications of original sin. However, upon closer inspection, the idea of limbo only resulted in more confusion and more problems. So, in October of 2003, Pope John Paul II assigned to the International Theological Commission the task of studying the possibility for salvation of unbaptized infants and the concept of limbo. Eventually, Pope Benedict of a document produced by the commission entitled The Hope of Salvation for Infants Who Die Without Being Baptized. The document recognizes the vast number of children who have died without being baptized and seeks to give assurance as to their salvation while not minimizing the importance of baptism and not letting go of original sin.
It states, from a theological point of view, the development of a theology of hope and an ecclesiology of the together with a recognition of the greatness of divine mercy, challenge an unduly restrictive view of salvation. In fact, the universal salvific spit, will of God spit, 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 and the corresponding spit, 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 spit. universal mediation of Christ mean that all theological notions that ultimately call into question the very omnipotence of God and His mercy in particular oh, are inadequate. It. it goes on to assert that due to original sin, damnation is still deserved, but whether by baptism, prayer, God or a special work it. of God, it is possible children are saved against their will and lacking knowledge in either Christ or their inherited sinfulness. Interestingly enough, the document notes that the Greek fathers held a very different view on the fate of deceased children as a result of their rejection of Augustinian original sin. The idea of an inheritance of sin or guilt common in Western tradition was foreign to this perspective since in their view sin could only be a free personal act. With this official Roman Catholic document, the concept of limbo is now, well, in limbo. The church today rejects the teaching, but now must overcome hundreds of years of teaching it. While Rome has and continues to wrestle with this, many reformers did not latch on to this teaching. Instead, they saw it as in direct opposition to original sin and doubled down on Augustine's teaching. Jonathan Edwards wrote, It is most just, exceeding just, that God should take the soul of a newborn infant and cast it into eternal torments. John Calvin believed that some infants who died may be of the elect and therefore saved by some special work of God, though he did not believe this was necessarily done for all. But how, they ask, are infants regenerated when not possessing the knowledge of either good or evil? We answer that the work of God, though beyond the reach of our capacity, is not therefore null. Moreover, infants who are to be saved, and that some are saved at this age of certain, must, without question, be previously regenerated by the Lord. For if they bring innate corruption with them from their mother's womb, they must be purified before they can be admitted into the kingdom of God, into which shall not enter anything that defileth. If they are born sinners, as David and Paul affirm, they must either remain unaccepted and hated by God, or be justified. Martin Luther's views on this topic seemingly evolved over time. Luther cast doubt on fellow reformer Ulrich Zwingli and his salvation due to his belief that all infants who die are saved. Instead, Luther asserted that all infants who die... I uh, see a dick in your future. I uh, see a dick. Ah, smart parents, of the fuck That it was only in baptism that infants themselves received saving faith. This view expressed by Luther was seemingly the most commonly held among the reformers that the right, children of unbelievers go to hell while the offspring of the faithful automatically enter the But the here blood. we encounter and a twist. troubling dilemma. Trying to solve the problem here, Billy. Not like this, you're not. You're not even looking at the problem. We're very aware of the problem. Move! Move! Wow, put your black ass with stones, slut. What if an unbeliever loses a child and yet comes to faith many years later? Does the deceased infant perish in eternal torment due to its parents' lack of faith at the time of its passing? Or does God retroactively save them as a result of their parents' eventual? Man, I gotta do a video Such on this theological damn shit. problems led many to mirror that of She's got long arms. Consequently, many modern adherents of original sin and... I'm about to come back to that shit and do a fucking video on that. These people are so fucking stupid. Are we born sinners? Is original sin and total depravity biblical? In this series, we'll consider the doctrines historic and modern what articulation, no, no take spit. a critical look at potential on, problems slut. that arise, examine the various passages used to teach this.
God. Holy Ghost. Come on, you slant that slut from China, Japan, and the Orient. I mean, the Orient. You Oriental prostitute. You Oriental prostitute. Come on, you slut. You Oriental prostitute. Come on, you slut that slut. I, I curse God if this thing don't unlock. Come on, you slut. He's bringing out that whore. That whore, that whore, that whore, that whore. Come on, you goddamn motherfucker. I curse the Holy Ghost if that's the I do. Spit, 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 spit. Come on, you goddamn slut, that slut. I curse the Holy Ghost with it. I do. I didn't know she's about to don't get this page. I do. I do. born sinners? Is original sin and total depravity biblical? In this series, we'll consider the doctrine's historic and modern articulations, take a critical look at potential problems that arise, examine the various passages used to teach this, considering the immediate and larger con- Bodily 
fluids in first century Judea. Oh, yeah, the sanitation, Reg. Remember what the city used to be like? Yeah, all right, I'll grant you the aqueduct, the sanitation, the two things the Romans had done. No one has written more than Dr. Jody Magnus. Possibly. <laughs> well, I've never heard anybody describe me that way, but okay. Nobody describe me that way, but okay. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Moose, Christian needs to look at the claims of Christians. We've wow, already covered evangelical YouTube stone, you darling archaeologist slut. Titus Kennedy on the Old Testament. Overview of the entirety of the Old Testament. Unfortunately, this has not gone well. You slant that slut from China, of Japan, and Orient. Is there Orient. actually any I mean, evidence Orient? for you the Exodus? Orient. Well, no, no, you no Orient. You Orient. You Orient. You Orient. You Orient. You Orient. So Slut. I'm very excited to be joined by one of the world's leading archaeologists focused Most on first century Slut. Judea, Dr. Joni Magnus. Thanks for having me. Dr. Magnus is one of ten world-class scholars. Dr. Joni Magnus. Thanks for having me. Dr. Magnus is old. one of ten world-class She's scholars cute. who are speaking at the upcoming New I Insights sure the New girl. Testament virtual conference happening in a few Come weeks. On, you An Slut. exciting two-day event tailored to people like me who are passionate about biblical scholarship you but aren't actually dick, scholars bitch. themselves. This is an amazing opportunity and value that I'm not going to miss. You suck but we'll talk about that dick, a bit bitch. later. For now, let's get back to the videos. Is there archaeological evidence to support the life, death, and ministry of Jesus? My guess you is Dr. Yes, that bishop goodbye, you slut. He's a professor with me at Biola University. Have you come across Dr. Kennedy before? Not until you sent me the links <laughs> yesterday. I'm sorry. No worries. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of chronologically walk through uh, issues in archaeology related to... <laughs> 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 Chronologically, uh, Dr. Titus Kennedy, you, you ready to rock stupid and roll? Motherfucker. I am. Thanks for having me back on you the show. Slut. Overall, I didn't have any huge objections to ah! what said. It all sounded fine. I think he sounded properly cautious and sort of reserved in what he was saying. For me, coming from a different background and a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. I don't see any slut. problem with acknowledging that these were real historical people who had certain you titles and who happened to be bitch. mentioned in the gospel accounts. I think that the gospel accounts contain a lot of historical references. I mean, I think it's like evaluating any other ancient source, but particularly when you're talking about the Bible, whether it's the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, it's a matter of Suck exactly which pieces bitch. of information are reliable or historical. How do you determine which ones are? And just because somebody who is a real historical figure is mentioned doesn't make the entire story historical, mm. right? So right. there's you that as well. You because there's a lot of fictional bitch. stories like the Avengers, for example, that are rooted in real buildings and real times and even real people outside of the Avengers. And of course, that doesn't prove that it's true. Sure. I, I don't have any huge problems with any of that. And I mean, I find the gospel accounts and especially the synoptics to be really interesting in terms of shedding light on the world of Jesus, right? Judaism in the time of Jesus. And so that's what interests me the most. But sure, I have a problem with that. If you don't mind, Damn, I could have it. Because I've been doing Man, a lot of work up. on the burial of Jesus of late. I just so the burial up. practices that we read I about just in the fucked gospel, up. I could have Sound stupid as shit. We know about stupid. I'm talking to me. And that's to be expected. Stupid. Something that many people would say would be uh, invented by the gospel writers. You may or may not be aware of this, but it's on this front Damn, that where you are a darling of Christian his apologist. Of Jody Magnus, an atheist archaeologist from the University of North Carolina. Whore, that whore, whore, that whore, that whore, that whore. Um, so she has no theological motivation. Let's see if I can so this is, yes, the gospel. Come on, you get it right. I have no idea. <laughs> you wrote the gospel accounts of Jesus. Move! Appear to be largely consistent with the archaeological wow, evidence. I put your black ass to stall it, even if you are white, you The gospel accounts describing slut. Jesus' removal from the cross and burial accord well with archaeological evidence and Jewish law. You are oft quoted. Yeah, I. I, 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 I <laughs> 
does that prove the Stupid! Of the accounts? It doesn't I just prove that the accounts are historical. Ah! It proves that whoever wrote those accounts was familiar with how the Jews of Jerusalem disposed of their dead in the time of Jesus. To take some emotion out of the topic, would you be willing to entertain some questions? About the thieves said to be executed on either side of Jesus? Okay, what about them? Well, I have no, never actually thought about them too much, but okay. Uh, according to what you've learned, would the thieves also have been taken down by sundown? Is that something that probably would have happened to their bodies as well? I uh, well, see a theory, dick in your in future. Other words, uh, ideally, I see a dick. To law, ideally, dick. even the worst criminals dick. are entitled to uh, proper burial within 24 hours of death. And so, if there was somebody <laughs> who could have to that, then yes. But the fact is, is that not everybody in the ancient world, including not all Jews, <laughs> had a proper burial, either within 24 hours or at all. And we have plenty of evidence for that. Let's put it this way. There was nothing to say that they wouldn't have been buried within 24 hours of death, taken down from the cross. I but that would have been if somebody who would have attended to that for them. Right. Yeah. So that's a maybe. Let's say there Sucker. wasn't. You bought that like a second of ton of bricks of shit. Who would have taken them down if no one came forward Slut. to claim them? There, I just into total speculation okay. here. I assume that since they were crucified by the Roman authorities, that at some point the Romans might have removed them from the crosses, but that doesn't mean they would have given them a proper burial. I'm not sure. Maybe they could have just been left on the crosses for a while to, you know. People were crucified, by the way, outside the walls of the city, right? right. So maybe they were just left Shut and then, you know, slut. vultures and animals ate their remains. We know Come that on, happened slut. a lot in the ancient world. There's oh. a wonderful passage in What's Suetonius' you, slut? biography, Life of Vespasian, where the emperor is dining at his breakfast table and a dog trots in and deposits a human hand under the breakfast table. So there were dogs okay, and other scavengers okay, around. Okay, come on, let's swap pores. Okay, we'll swap pores. And so anybody whose remains were not properly disposed of, and come apparently on, that slut. was a not small part of the population, was subject to being scavenged in that way. I mean, this is also even Get if that you go damn back earlier, you can think of Jezebel, slut. right? The death of Jezebel right. and how you know she's pitched out of the window, right? The second story window plops down onto the ground. And then when they go to bury her remains, all they find are like her hands ah! because the rest have been scavenged by dogs. So ah! Stupid! Because that was stupid. You got sorted. You got sorted in that dick. Responsibility for slut. burying dead bodies. Do we have any kind of archaeological evidence about the two you burial places that they slut that slut. are said to have kept for such criminals? Has, has that come up in archaeology at all? Yeah, it's a really good and kind of a complicated question. And the first layer ah! is how applicable is what's in the Mishnah to what's ah! in the time of Jesus. That is before 70, right? Because right. the Mishnah obviously is a later source. And even with the information that it contains, it's not always clear ah! how it is descriptive and how much of it is prescriptive. Uh, uh, I'm that in your room. So there's, that's a separate problem. Uh, also, the Mishnah's description is referring to, now I'm not saying it wouldn't necessarily apply, but it's actually referring to criminals who were executed by the Sanhedrin for violations of Jewish law. And that's not what's happening in the case of Jesus. Jesus was sentenced to death by the Romans on a charge of treason and not for a violation of Jewish law. So the Mishnah description, even if we take it at face value, is not necessarily applicable to the case of Jesus, right? So there's that problem. And then there's a whole other thing where we actually I got one more to advise you, some unfortunate resign who was crucified and interred in a rock cut tomb in Jerusalem. We have now all you got left ankle bone pounds. with the nail through it, and it's actually the I only physical his. remains of a crucifixion Hole! victim that's ever been found archaeologically. You and so that shows that bitch. here we actually do have a case of somebody who received a proper burial in a rock cut tomb, which is not just some random cemetery like you hear about in the Mishnah. It's a proper family mausoleum, so to speak. I mean, I think that there is a whole problem with that. And then I will say, no, we don't have any archaeological remains of anything like the kind of burial ground that the Mishnah is describing. That doesn't mean that there wasn't something like that. Sure. To be able to identify that you'd have in archaeology, you'd have to find 
some sort of a massive pit grave, or I don't, I don't actually, not even that. I'm not Come sure on, exactly slut. how you would identify that, short of having inscriptions that explicitly say so. But I will say that God I'm not so sure that what the Mishnah des- is describing was historical, and, okay. and the reason is because all of the information that we have about Jewish burials in this period is that if they have proper, well, here we have to actually go into a, a whole separate thing about how Jews disposed of their dead, right? Sure. So. One of the problems I have with the way many of my colleagues, my archaeological colleagues, study Jewish burials of the time of Jesus in the area of Jerusalem is that they focus on rock-cut tombs. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising because rock-cut tombs are very visible in the landscape. They're virtually indestructible unless you blow them up. And so they're well-preserved, and about a thousand of them are documented in the area of Jerusalem. And each one contained a number of spaces for bodies to be placed. But if you take into account that, let's say, again, we have about a thousand that are documented, let's say that we have maybe a quarter, a fifth, whatever, of the original rocket tombs that existed or that we know of, only a fraction of those that existed. Even if you multiply the number that we know by four yeah. times, by five times, whatever, and take into account the number of spaces for burials within those tombs, which were used by families over the course of generations. Right. It's really our, we would call today a mausoleum, right? Each one belonged to a family and was used by the members of that family over the course of generations. So even if you multiply, and but then you take into account that these tombs were used by members of a family over the course of several generations, so let's say first century BC, first century AD, you're still coming up far short of the number of tombs that you would need to accommodate all of the population of Jerusalem during that span of time. And that's even if we take a very modest estimate of the number of people who lived in Jerusalem at around, let's say, 60,000 people at any one time. That's a modest estimate, doesn't take into account pilgrims and things like that. So that's why I think it's unfortunate that my archaeolo- many of my archaeological colleagues focus on rock cut tombs to the exclusion of everything else. And we know, in fact, that throughout the ancient world, and you go to other places, like you go to Greece, you look at Rome, you look at the evidence, you see that everywhere around the ancient pants. world, there were always different kinds of burial customs, which basically reflected the means of the individual or the family. So if you were I wealthy, just shit you in had a big mausoleum that was flashy and located in a prominent position. But if you weren't so wealthy and you I were lucky enough, your pants. family might or friends or whatever might dispose of you the way we bury our dead today, actually, at what I call a trench grave, mm-hmm. which is how I think Jesus would have been disposed of if he had been given a proper burial but not placed in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, according to the story. And then, of course, there were many people, unfortunate people, who had nobody to attend to them when they died. Maybe those two thieves <laughs> right. crucified on that- either side of Jesus, right? <laughs> who didn't have anybody to attend to them and whose remains got scavenged. Or we have plenty of sources, including rabbinic literature, which refer to human remains being deposited in empty cisterns or pits or whatever. Same thing, by the way, in Rome, for example. So actually only a small part of the overall population received the burial that would still be visible in the archaeological landscape today. And the vast majority of people were disposed of in a way that left very few, if any, traces in the archaeological record. And so that's one of the problems with understanding the Mishnah's evidence, then one of the problems that I have is that when we do have evidence of people being buried together, right, in in some sort of like a mausoleum or rock cut tomb or something like that, and they're not buried according to what they were executed for or, you know, whatever. They're buried as families. Even a little later at Beit Sharim, which is a gigantic Jewish necropolis in the northern part of Israel and Galilee, which dates to the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, so after 70. And there you start to get slightly different burial customs and it's very large catacombs. So there you do get people buried who are from all different kinds of places and families and things. But even there, what you see are clusters of families who acquire a part of the catacomb. So I'm not sure that what the mission is describing is really historical. I'm not ruling out the possibility, but again, we don't have anything in the archaeology that corresponds with what it describes. Gotcha. That's not so surprising, right? right? You know, it's actually interesting. So coming back to the, there is actually a passage in Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, where he refers to a situation during the time of the first Jewish revolt against the Romans in Jerusalem, where the Romans were crucifying rebels outside the walls of the city. These happened to be Idumeans, so they were Idumean Jews. They were Idumeans who had been converted to Judaism at some point. And he he actually refers to the Jews taking care 
to get the bodies from the crosses and bury them within 24 hours. And so that indicates that there certainly were cases. I don't know that this happened all the time, but there was somebody who sometimes was concerned right. to to take these bodies off the crosses. He doesn't say any more about who these were. The people who worried you about getting these bodies bitch. off the crosses and burying them, were they just random groups of Jews who were worried about that? Or were they some friends or relatives or something like that? We don't know. And by the way, in the Roman world, there were burial societies. People joined. People paid. Wow. I'm a member of, of our, yeah. Okay. I'm a member of our local Rotary Club, by the way. So it's kind of like that, actually, in that you paid your membership, right, in a burial society in order to ensure that when you died, your remains would be properly disposed of. Oh, this is so much better than what I had imagined. Yeah. I thought they were getting together on Friday night and just burying uh, people. Uh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. No, and so... so oh, so um, this is so like a timeshare situation. Or something. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's right. It's like a timeshare. Yeah. So, again, because, you know, because people knew, at least... Especially, I suppose, if you if your family didn't have like a big mausoleum right. where you knew you would be interred after you died, you wanted to make sure that your remains were properly disposed of, right? And so, uh, yeah. kinds of burial societies. All right. Well, thank you for taking on so my pet passion. Bitch. Let's see if Titus touches on any of yours. So we've got King Herod the Great. Now he's a very well known figure. I don't think hardly anyone is. He's presented as a king with a title of king, right? Now we can look at Josephus and see that, of course, too. But on his coins, Herod had some very, very interesting things. Like he calls himself King Herod on those coins. So he has the title of king, just like we see in the Gospels. It's not a governor. It's not some other title that he had. It was elevated to the position of king. And Herod also has some other interesting aspects on his coins. Uh, one of them shows this this helmet with the star on it, and it seems to be a Roman symbol. Ah, uh, see a dick in your the, future. Ah, uh, see a dick. But it also dick. has some sort dick. of messianic interpretations too. Beyond just this coin, what can you tell us about Herod and what he thought about himself? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. That's one of the, my favorite things that I've done recently. But I will say about that coin, ah! about that particular coin, I connected with a mint at Samaria at the time I wrote that paper about it, which was a long time ago. I didn't connect it with messianic expectations. Eh. I would be a little reluctant to do that now. I actually connected eh. it with the a cult of quarry at Samaria because it's the cap of the dais quarry, and there's ah! stone blocks from a temple or shrine to Cory at Samaria that have that same design on them. So anyway, I there I would actually be a little bitch. you know hesitant to make that leap. But the recent paper that I wrote, which was published in 2019, is about Herod's tomb at Herodion. Herod the Great ruled from 40 BC until spitz, his death spitz, in 4 BC. Spitz, and spitz, 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 spitz. tells us that when Herod died, and he died in his winter palace at Jericho, his body was brought to uh, I see a dick and in your so future. I uh, see a dick. It happens dick. to be the only dick. site that we know dick. of. There's one other possible candidate, but spit, let's spit, ignore spit, that. Spit, that spit, Herod spit, built spit, and named spit. after himself. He built a lot of things, and he always named everything that he built after somebody, in honor of somebody, like, you know, Caesarea, which he named in honor of Augustus or whatever. But Herodium is the only place that he put his own name on. And it, it's a fortified desert palace very close to Bethlehem, and actually, I'm practically spitting distance of Bethlehem, oh, wow. it towers, literally, it, it towers over Bethlehem. And so, it's interesting because apparently, so Herod named it. Herodium after himself, because he intended it to serve as his everlasting memorial, right? It's his monument to himself. Now, Josephus tells us that Herod was buried at Herodium when he died, but he doesn't say where the tomb was located. That's a big site. It's a mountain, actually. Herod literally created an artificial mountain there. And finally, in 2007, the late Israeli archaeologist Ehud Netzer and his team found the tomb, which is a mausoleum, halfway up the side of the mountain, more or less on the side facing towards Jerusalem. And in so the paper that I wrote about this, what I say is, in my opinion, the discovery of Herod's tomb at Herodium is the most important discovery in this region since the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wow. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been described as the most important archaeological discovery of the 20th century. I think that Herodium is the next one after that for this century. 
And the reason I think that is because spit, we have spit, no spit, direct spit, sources spit, of information spit, on Herod in the sense that we have no writings that okay. he wrote. Right. All of our Suck information dick, about bitch. Herod is filtered through other sources. So our main source is Josephus, who drew his information, who was born four decades after Herod died. So I just got much of a whore. During the time of Herod, he is drawing on his information from various sources, primarily the lost biography of Herod written by Herod's court biographer Nicolaus of Damascus. So we know Suck that Josephus was bitch. taking a lot of information from there, but we don't know what he did with that information because we don't have the original. So we have Josephus, we have scattered references to Herod in, in other sources. We have the New Testament, of course, right? The massacre of the innocents right. in, in Matthew. And then some scattered references also in ancient Jewish sources, whatever. Pretty much all of our information about Herod from Did. these written sources Did. is negative. Presents Herod in a very negative ah. And what's important about the discovery of Herod's tomb, in my opinion, is that now you see Herod oh, well, in his geez. own eyes. Oh. see him in the way that he wanted to be remembered and memorialized. The message that he is giving us unfiltered directly after 2,000 years. And so I wrote this paper about the mausoleum, and it has, so again, I'll just distinguish and say the mausoleum is the structure okay. in which Herod's remains were placed or his remains were placed next to it or something. It's basically the structure that marks the spot where Herod was buried, and it's located partway up the mountain, just to be clear about the terminology of mausoleum. God, gotcha. fucking so it damn turns it out I this mausoleum up. is a, a kind of a freestanding monument I with just a, kind of a up. tall, elevated square podium. It's all made out of stone. And on top of that, Paul Ray's podium on, was a circular slut. structure, which is called a tholos. Tholos is just Greek for circular structure. Okay. <laughs> Surrounded by 18 ionic columns. Ionic columns are the kinds that have the little curly Q capitals. And then on top of that, a kind of a conical roof that goes up from there. And so the team that worked with Ehud Metzer and published a really extensive study of the tomb and the mausoleum and pointed out that, you know, there are a lot, and, and other scholars have also talked about Herodium in this life. How do we situate this kind of structure within the larger Street Greek whore. and Roman context? And, and it turns out that, like all of Herod's other buildings and monuments, it's a hybrid. Herod drew on different kinds of traditions, oh. and, he, and he makes a unique combination of things. And so he draws on native you traditions, like Judean dick, traditions, or Nabataean, because he was half Nabataean, right? His mother was Nabataean. And on Greek traditions, or Hellenistic traditions, and on Roman, right? And it all merges Suck together, without slut. going into all of the different Come on, parallels. Dickhole. When you look at what we have at Herodium, it's actually Come on, you the dickhole. closest, the, th the things that are closest are the Mausoleum of Augustus at Rome, which if some of your viewers have ever been to Rome, they might be familiar with it. It's an enormous structure that's a circular Dicko. cylinder that originally had a massive pile of dirt around it. So it looked like a cylinder coming out of a mound of earth. And the mound of earth is what's called a tumulus. And then the burials were inside that cylindrical structure. So Herodium is somewhat similar to that in that you have a tumulus, this mountain, Coming out of the mountain, originally there was a circular fortress, so it would have looked actually bitch. quite close to what you have at Rome in, okay. in the Mausoleum of Augustus. But then you also have this like separate mausoleum structure on the side of the mountain, the side of the tumulus at Herodium. And where is that coming from? Fuck That's you. coming from the Hellenistic world. Mm. And actually the inspiration is indirectly the most famous tomb of antiquity, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. That's where we get our word mausoleum from, because somewhere in the middle of the 4th century BC, a king who ruled in the area of what is today the southwest coast of Turkey, ancient Halicarnassus, modern Bodrum, died. Suck, His name was Mausoleus, and bitch. he was buried in an enormous monument you that consisted of a huge square elevated podium that had a temple-like structure on top surrounded with columns and that tomb monument became so famous that ever since then monumental tombs have been called mausolea oh, there you after go. the mausoleum in halicarnassus so what happens when the mausoleum in halicarnassus is built and it becomes famous you is that rich and famous people all around bitch. the mediterranean world start to build their own versions and we also see this even in judea before the time of herod but so that's basically like when you talk about this mausoleum shit. on the side of herodium you know, that's the ultimate source of inspiration, but there's something a little weird about it. And what's weird about Herod's mausoleum is that 
The other mausolea, generally, when they had a building on top of the raised podium, it was a rectilinear or square building surrounded with columns, looking like a little temple, okay. kind of, right, with a pitched roof. Mm -hmm. In Herod's mausoleum, it's circular. It's a tholos, and that's unusual. And again, it's surrounded by 18 ionic columns, and this is where I came in, because I noticed, I'll take credit, because I think it's just, <laughs> I was so happy that I noticed this, right? There is a very famous ancient tholos that had 18 ionic columns around it, and, and 18 ionic columns is significant because, again, if your viewers are familiar with ionic capitals, ionic columns are basically columns that at the top have the capital is the thing at the top of the column, and they have these little curly Q things that look like rolled up scrolls right, yep. on either side, top, right? That kind of a column, that kind of a capital is not well suited to a circular structure because ionic capitals have two sides. Right. So if you use them, you want to use them in a rectilinear structure, not a circular structure. Circular structures would be much better off with a Doric column, which is just like a simple cushion, or with a Corinthian capital, which is the one with the leaves carved all the way going around. But ionic doesn't fit circular structures. So you rarely find tholoi circular structures that are surrounded with ionic columns. But there's a very famous one again, and it's surrounded not just with ionic columns, bitch. but with 18 ionic columns, which is exactly what we have at Erodium. And that is a, a structure called the Philippian at Olympia. So Olympia in Greece is the site of the sanctuary of Zeus. And there, the father of Alexander the Great, whose name was Philip, built a structure inside the grounds of the sanctuary, this is unusual, to honor himself and his family after he defeated the other Greek city-states in this big famous battle. So he establishes this kind of a victory monument inside the grounds of the sanctuary, inside the, the sort of perimeter, but also with statues of himself and his family, his wife, and Alexander was there, his son Alexander, on the grounds of the sanctuary, and it's something that is not usual in ancient Greece in this period, this sort of merging of a mortal Greek ruler with the idea of divinity, because again, it's inside the sanctuary. And this is something that becomes much more pronounced with Alexander the Great, this kind of a mortal Greek ruler becoming worshipped as divine. So then you might say, well, how would Herod have actually even known of the Philippia, right? Where, what's the connection? Well, it turns out that Herod, when he visited Rome in 12 BC, returns to Judea by way of Olympia. And at Olympia, he bestowed on Olympia, which was in decline at that point. I'm sure your listeners know the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Olympic Games are called the Olympic Games because the very first games were held at Olympia in the year 776 BC. So by this point, though, Olympia is in decline. The games are in decline. And Herod bestows a huge amount of money on Olympia and to keep the games going and all sorts of other stuff. And they actually made him an honorary president for life. And then he goes back to Herodium. And guess what? <laughs> That's when that little mausoleum is built with the 18 Ionic columns. So... If we look at the mausoleum in the form of Herodium in its larger context, it's <laughs> making connections both with Augustus, but also poem. with Alexander the Great. And it's not, and I know it sounds like I'm going on and on, but I'm actually greatly oversimplifying the whole thing. I but, believe it, yeah. Yeah, but at any rate, what's interesting is that both Alexander and Alexander was the prototype of these sort of rulers in the Hellenistic and Roman worlds. Everybody emulated Alexander. So Alexander and then these later rulers like Augustus or whatever, they're all emulating him. And that means that they're not just rulers, they're ruling with sort of this idea that they're either divine or they become divine. They become deified after their deaths, one or the other. And by emulating these other monuments, Herod is making a statement. He's placing himself directly in that tradition. The message that he is sending is he is comparing himself and his dynasty, which he hopes to establish, to Alexander the Great, to Augustus. Now, any non-Jew in the Greek and Roman world would have looked at this and said, it makes perfect sense. But for the Jews, that would have been a big problem, right? That you have a mortal ruler, first of all, claiming to be divine. Right. Right? Jews didn't accept that. But even the idea of Herod as a legitimate king would have been a problem in the eyes of many of the Jews that he ruled over because he was not descended from the native Jewish dynasty, the Hasmoneans. He wasn't even fully Jewish, right? His mother wasn't Jewish. God so damn it. he was Jewish on his father's side of the family through forced conversion. How Jewish he was considered, eh, depends on who you ask. But anyway, okay, but so to try and claim that he's a legitimate king 
when he's not even fully Jewish, when he's appointed by the Romans, an outside power, to be king of Judea, right, is to establish himself in the eyes of his Jewish population, to establish his legitimacy. Well, what's the best way to do that? You want to connect yourself to David. Right. Because if you connect yourself to David, who is, of course, the royal messiah, what does it mean, royal messiah, not a god? It means the royal anointed one, right? The legitimate exactly. king yep. in the line of David. If one can connect yourself to David, then you can legitimize yourself as the king. And that is apparently what Herod tried to do. And already many years ago, an Israeli scholar, Avraham Shalit, wrote a book about Herod, and it's not read that much by a lot of people because it was written in German and translated into Hebrew. I think that's the, the okay. order. I've read the Hebrew, not the German, but it was never translated into English, which is kind of too bad. But he actually made this observation. He suggested that Herod claimed to be the fulfillment of the expectation of a Davidic Messiah, which was apparently a widespread expectation already at that time, and we see that also in the Gospel accounts. And he did this by, among other things, he doesn't talk about the tomb at Herodium because that, of course, had not been found yet, but Shalit makes this connection by pointing out that there's, in particular, one passage in Josephus where Herod claims to rule by the will of God. It's God's will that I have been appointed king, and what Shalit says is we see that Herod is Work presenting himself again. as the fulfillment of the expectation of a Davidic Messiah by rebuilding the Jerusalem temple mm. on a massive scale where he actually outdoes Solomon, right? Mm -hmm. And what Herod then does is he plugs into the existing sort of Roman environment of an era of peace and prosperity, this sort of golden age in the time of Augustus. What have the Romans ever done for us? I gotta shit again. Bro, peace. Oh, peace. Shut up. And Harry then says, it is through the agency of the Romans that we are in an era of peace and prosperity. Thanks to the Romans appointing me king, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's like, okay, and now in Herodium, we can look and see what's going on here. And one of the things that I had long God asked myself, and this was long before the mausoleum was discovered, is why Herod had himself buried at Herodia. I couldn't figure it out. You know, of all the places, he could have been buried anywhere. Why on that spot? And then finally it all so made God sense got rid because of it overlooks God. Bethlehem. The connection to David, right? You want to connect yourself to David. Bethlehem is the birthplace of David. Look at the trouble that the gospel writers go to to connect Jesus to David by way of Bethlehem, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean, he's from Nazareth, but ooh, but no, actually, he's from Bethlehem, right? So I think that the placement of Herodium, among other things, was intended to visually connect Herod with the birthplace of David. And again, I think it's a statement. So I think that you have two things going on here with the mausoleum. On the one hand, you have Herod situating himself in this sort of royal, dynastic, and divine line of rulers from Alexander and then going through Augustus by way of the way that he constructs his final resting place, but also for the Jewish side then, laying claim to having fulfilled the expectations associated with the Davidic Messiah. And as, you know, I have colleagues who are like, oh, this just sounds so far-fetched, right? That Herod would have claimed to be Messiah, that anybody would have actually believed this. But then in the Gospel accounts, we get references to this group called the Herodians. You do. And who are these weird Herodians, yes. right? Who you hear about with the Pharisees and this and that, right? And nobody knows, there's no agreement about who this group is, although a lot of scholars think that they're some sort of a group of the elite that were aligned with Herod, and therefore they're called the Herodians. But what's really interesting is that we also get references, quite a few actually, to Herodians in later literature. From about the year 200 AD on, we have a series of ancient authors beginning with Pseudo Tertullian, who's not actually necessarily an individual, but that's a whole other thing. But anyway, going on through there, these ancient authors who call them a Jewish sect, called the Herodians, who believed that Herod was the Messiah. That's how they're defined in these authors starting from around the year 200. If we can retroject that back to the New Testament, then it goes all the way to the first century. That's a little bit of a leap. But what it means is that by the time you get to the beginning of the third century, and then going on from there, there were Christian authors 
who believed that there was a group that there had been, whether or not they existed or whatever, but they write about them. And some of them, like Jerome, actually, you know, seem to be threatened by this, you know, oh, this is a group that thinks that Herod's the Messiah, whereas actually the Messiah is Jesus, right? So it appears that the idea that Herod not only claimed to be the Messiah, but actually that there were people who accepted that claim, that that is something that's real. And now we go back yeah. to the way Harry chose to memorialize right himself there. in his mausoleum yeah. and his tomb in Rome. Yeah, together. Pizza. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pizza well, I'm wondering pizza. now if that makes it more or less likely that he <laughs> killed yeah. him yeah. in Bethlehem. Yeah. Oh, right. So then you get to that. Yeah. So I don't know whether that episode in Matthew, the massacre of the innocents, whether it actually happened okay. or not. Right. There's a, again, scholars disagree. Many scholars think that it's a fabricated story. Right, that it never happened, that it was inspired by Herod's. I just dicked up his poem. Ha 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 ha. Slut. Man, I have to go shit badly. I gotta finish this fucking game. I can just get my king parallel to his. Come on, goddamn motherfucker. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. Yes, do. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. Damn, I could have fucked him up. Suck my dick, bitch. Gotta go for the fucking still, mate.
I gotta go shit. I just took another shit. That ally is worth having a shit two, three times a day to lose the weight. It's first fucking worth it, slut. God damn it. God fucking damn it. He's being out of that whore.
You suck my dick, bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. You suck my dick, bitch. God damn it. Suck my dick, bitch. God damn it. Son of a bitch. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. He's trying to gent has Uzi arms me. Suck my slut, bitch. Suck, suck my dick. What about patty cakes? Patty cakes are not long. Suck my dick, bitch. God fucking damn it. I'm percent of the fuck out of you, slut. You slut that slut from Heidi. Come on, slut. Ah! 
God fucking damn it. No. <sighs> Moose, slut. Moose, you slut, dad, slut. He's trying to Janet has Uzi on me. Get these fucking poems to safety. Spit bit, spit bit, spit bit, spit bit, spit bit. Spit bit, spit bit, spit bit, spit bit, spit bit. <laughs> With the rook. God, fuck it. Whispering, no, 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 I fuck his hole with the rug. 
Man, I stuck my dick up his butt. And then twisted. Come on, you slut, that slut. Street whore. Suck my slut. God damn it. God fucking damn it. Suck my dick, bitch. You suck my motherfucking dick, bitch. Damn it. God damn it. I think I just fucked up. <laughs> stupid! No, you just fucked up. Cause I was stupid! You stupid bitch. Bitch. Stupid bitch. Bitch. Oh, you now but her. You slut.
God damn it. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it.
Come on, slut, move. Move, slut. Move, you snap that fucking slut. Fuck you. Goddamn slant out slut. Move slut. You just better let me take that rope, boy. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. it all fits together absolutely yeah although i'm wondering now if that makes it more or less likely that he killed infants in bethlehem oh right so then you get to that so i don't know whether that episode in matthew the massacre of the innocents whether it actually happened or not right there's a again scholars disagree many scholars think that it's a fabricated story right that it never happened that it was inspired by herod's reputation for having his own sons put to death right that's where it goes so I don't know whether that actually happened or not, but I do think that the story as presented in the Gospel of Matthew reflects one reaction to Herod's claim. The reaction is because one of the things in that passage that, that the author of the Gospel of Matthew does is he keeps repeating Bethlehem, 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 and that Jesus is from Bethlehem and Jesus is the legitimate Messiah. And so Herod is presented as not just not the Messiah, right? Not the legitimate Messiah, but Herod is basically now, an antichrist who tries body. to have the true legitimate Messiah put to death. Exactly. So I think that the story is one reaction among one re Jewish reaction to Herod's claim. So clearly, Jews re different groups of Jews reacted differently to Herod's claim. So you have, I think that there was probably a group, whether they were called the Herodians or not, who accepted Herod's claim. God and they were probably hell. members of the elite. They were probably in his circle because they benefited from being in Herod's circle. But then there were obviously other Jewish groups that opposed this claim. And I think that's the reaction that we see in the story of the massacre of the innocents. That makes a lot of sense. I yeah, know. it's really cool. One day when I have time, I hope to go back and continue working on that and expand it because it's just like, it started to go off in all sorts of directions and I had to like cut it at some point. But, right. Yeah. One of the things we wanted to do today is get word out about the New Insights into New Testament conference hosted by Dr. Bart Ehrman, where you're one of the stars of the show. Your lecture is called In the Footsteps of Jesus, Exploring Jerusalem's Sacred Sites. What will you be covering? Yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. Look, I don't have that much time. Jerusalem is such a huge topic, God right? So I'm obviously it. looking for connections here with Jesus, so mainly focusing on the area of the Temple Mount, the area around the Temple Mount, by which I mean, for example, the Antonia Fortress, and then the traditions associated with the Via Dolorosa, meaning the route that was walked by Jesus from the point where he's sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate and picks up the cross, and then to the point where he's crucified. I won't be talking a whole lot about the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and I won't have time to go into the whole stuff of the burial, but basically those are the things that I'll be talking about. And I'll have to start with a little bit of background about the layout of Jerusalem. You can't just like launch in and start talking about things without people.